snapshot in time and to help the corridor act uh, in a more modern fashion, right? To meet the goals of what we're trying to meet with our board of supervisors and the vision that those before us have brought forward. Um, so part of that is changing the road from a busy congested roadway, right? To try to consolidate traffic to make it safer for everyone that operates in the corridor. That's if you're riding a bike, driving a car. Uh, we are also looking with our transportation group to add in a bus stop here and there to make sure we get a bus route through there. 
Um, so again, we're trying to accommodate everybody. This is not a one size fits all. Um, I've talked to a number of you throughout the, the year and a half that we've done this project, and I've heard your concerns, our staff have heard your concerns. We understand, it's not perfect, right? Not every, every project we do is gonna have challenges. Uh, it's gonna bring benefits to the community, and it's gonna have costs to the community, right? It's disruptive, we totally get that, right? And, and nobody here is saying we're perfect, um, so th again, that's why we're here. We're here to hear your concerns. And if we can make an adjustment in the, in the process, in the project, throughout the corridor, we will make every effort to do that, right? And that's our goal. Our goal here is to solve problems, to help you uh, manage this process. We get it. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard for people to access your businesses, right? You might be confused on if there's a detour. You know, detours are going to be changing throughout the course of the process. Um, so it's our goal is to help, or our, our goal is to help understand what your concerns and complaints are and try to meet those needs and address them. Um, I think, I think I'll go to the next slide. So what have we been up to? So last time we met was in May 2nd, 2022. We were roughly at the 15% design. So we were very rough in where things were laid out, right? We still had kind of some big ideas of what we wanted to do, what we thought would happen based on some preliminary engineering reports that we had. So from that date until today, you know, it's been about 10 months or uh, nine months, we've advanced the, the design to 60%. So that's what you see over here on these boards. So we have everything digitally, but if you're more of a paper person, if you'd like to come up and touch it, see it, see where things are at, we have the whole entire quarter laid out. The east side of the boards over here is North Carson Street, or oh, sorry, the west side. On the east side or the far side of the building is the freeway where we're gonna end the project. Um, so all along the way, we've got the new lane configurations, the striping plans, uh, where we're doing landscaping. Uh, so basically the high level overview of what you'll expect to see when the project continues. We've been in coordination with NDOT and FHWA. So with this project came a lot of grant money. Um, so with, with the $9.3 million we received from the RAISE grant, we have to check a number of boxes that the Federal Highways Association uh, puts towards on us. And so some of that goes down to the impacts the project has from an environmental standpoint, right? To make sure that we're not damaging endangered species, um, we're looking at the waters of the U.S. to make sure we're not impacting any of the water bodies. And so there's a laundry list of things that we have to do. We're happy to do them because it makes sure that we're not missing anything critical the project needs. We also look at historic resources. Um, if there's any historic buildings along the corridor, we, we take a look at those and evaluate those. Um, but there's a laundry list of things that we do. We also looked at right-of-way impacts. So part of the project, uh, in order to facilitate some of the sidewalk and street improvements, we often have to do some type of improvement or disturbance on the adjacent properties, right? So if you have even something as simple as new sidewalk, if we're expanding sidewalk or putting sidewalk adjacent to your property, we often have to put form boards, right, in order to facilitate the installation of that sidewalk. And so if there's any impact to your property, we would come and talk to you first. We'll let you know exactly what's going on. We actually have a ded dedicated right <coughs> team that will be in contact with anybody here that has a business affected by the project, and they will be talking you through that process, what it means, uh, and, and kind of what the, the entire steps are from A to B to get you through that process. And of course, staff up here, we're always available to talk if you have something you'd like to come talk to us about. Uh, and we've been to RTC, the Board of Supervisors, and the Redevelopment Authority uh, a handful of times between now um, with 30%, 60% designs coming up, so we'll be reaching out to them. Part of the reason we're also having this conversation with you all here tonight is because any concerns that you have, we'll try to consolidate those, and we'll bring those forward to the RTC and the Board of Supervisors where we go and talk to your elected officials and your appointed officials uh, during this process. Okay, so in today's presentation, um, Angie's gonna go next. She's gonna talk about the concepts for the 60% design. We're gonna give a brief update on the project timeline. So what does that look like? When do we plan on getting design finished? And when we go to construction, when do you expect to see shovels in the ground? We we'll also have a Q&A session. So again, if you have questions, happy to stick around as long as you need to answer those questions. Um, if you just like to talk to us one-on-one -on -one after the presentation, that's totally fine too. We have five staff members to look around here. So if you wanna pull one of us aside and just talk about something, no problem there as well. Um, and then uh, we'll just kind of have an open discussion at the end of the meeting. So with that, uh, Angie, take it away. Thanks, Randy. Okay, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna be walking you through the design concept from west to east of the corridor, starting at North Carson Street and ending at I-5-80. Before I do that, I wanted to point out a couple things. One, I wanna introduce you to Sean Teeter, who's sitting here in front. Uh, Sean is a senior designer with NCE 
uh, who is uh, very familiar with the design. He's available to answer any um, detailed, specific questions you have, uh, particularly if myself or the city team cannot answer that question. Um, I'm going to be showing you the surface improvements. What you're not going to see is everything that we're doing underground. So we are going to be undergrounding uh, overhead utilities. We're also going to be upgrading the storm drain system to fix any drainage issues that are out there. We're also going to be upgrading the water and the sewer system. So you're not going to see that on here, but just please keep in mind that there's a whole bunch of stuff happening underground as well. So the first thing you're going to see is we're going to show you a picture of the existing uh, roadway. So this is North Carson Street to Stewart Street. This is as it is today. This is with the improvements on it, and this is with the highlights. So what we're doing between Carson Street and Stewart Street is we're eliminating one eastbound lane. We're also adding uh, pedestrian improvements uh, and bike lanes on both sides of the roads, both the north side and the south side, as well as improving the pedestrian lighting and adding landscape areas. We're also including a traffic calming median at North Plaza Street. Next is Stewart to Roof. This is what it looks like today. This is our proposed design. And what we've done in this area is on North Stewart Street, we've added a dedicated right turn lane. We've improved the street lighting. We've also added pedestrian improvements on both sides of the road. We've included bike lanes <coughs> east and westbound, and also a traffic calming median at, oh, that's Murphy? Wall Street. North Wall Street. North Wall Street. <coughs> This is route um, to Mills Park. So in this location, we're going to be improving the multi-use path. We're also going to be improving street lighting and adding landscaping. We're going to be providing additional parking at Mills Lane Park, at Mills Park, along with electric vehicle charging stations. In, I'm sorry, is that a question? No. Okay. Uh, in this location, we're going to be providing buffered bike lanes, so we have enough room to separate the bikes from the street, from the vehicles with a three-foot three foot buffer. That's the striping that you see right here. So that's the actual buffer between the cars and the bikes. And we will also be providing some traffic, a traffic calming medium, as well as slightly narrowing the traffic lanes. This is in front of Mills Park. In this location, we're continuing the buffer bike lanes. We're widening the existing medium that is in front of Mills Park to provide more good landscaping. We'll be improving the street lighting as well as adding some traffic calming mediums and narrowing the lanes. There will be additional parking on the east end of the parking lot. And we'll be providing a crosswalk with uh, pedestrian activated flashers. Now that location is to be determined. If you had a chance to look at the boards back there, we actually have three proposed locations for the crosswalks. And we're asking for your feedback as part of the questionnaire. So if you haven't had a chance to fill that out, please take a look at it. Let us know which location you think would be best for this crosswalk. And also on the north side of the road, uh, improving the sidewalk and adding landscape areas there as well. <clears throat> Continuing east, this is from the east end of the park to Salomon. <clears throat> Again, continuing the buffer bike lanes, adding landscape areas and improving the multi-use path. The bus stops that we're showing um, are Approximate. So they haven't been finalized yet. These bus stops in particular will be placed near the location of the final crosswalk. So once that crosswalk location is determined, the bus stop will be located there appropriately. Also adding traffic calming median at State Street, as well as narrowing the traffic lanes in this area. We're also removing a left turn lane from William Street uh, onto northbound South. Next is Salomon to just east of Rand. 
And we've also placed some markers on these maps to help uh, orient, orientate ourselves, right? So you can see the chevrons on, on here, and we tried to put some location markers to, to help people um, and figure out where we're at here in the corridor. So on this location, we're enhancing the landscape areas. We're including the buffer bike lanes again throughout the corridor. Uh, pedestrian improvements on both sides of the street. And in this location, we're increasing the left turn storage from Williams, William Street uh, to turn southbound on North Salomon Street, as well as a traffic calming median at Rand Avenue. Uh, and what does that mean? Traffic calming. So when you when you put in medians, it can serve a lot of purposes. It can provide refuge for pedestrians if you had a crosswalk there. It can also provide landscape areas, um, but it slows down the traffic because it's providing a buffer there, and you can't in access management. So the purpose of this meeting right here is you will not be able to turn left from Rand Avenue onto Street. How narrow are these going to be? In this area, I believe they are 11 feet wide. Existing is 12 feet. To, to give you reference, 12 to, 12 to 13 feet lane widths is what is out there right now. And in this area, they'll be reduced to 11 feet. Did you say you're, they're taking the turn lanes off? You're going east to go north on South? Mm -hmm. Is that turn lane leaving? One of the turn lanes going east, turning north on Salomon, is getting removed. Oh, there's still be a turn lane? Yes, there's still a turn lane now. Okay. <coughs> yes. For the steam on this road, you, you mentioned the um, traffic lanes have been narrowed down to about a 12-foot standard for federal funding for a federal funded project. Sean, can you answer that? I don't yeah, it's pretty standard. In fact, in some areas, we even go down to 10 or 10 and a half foot lanes, depending on the speed. That's right. That's why I asked about the speed, because it's, the speed you're talking about is 40 miles an hour for that 11 foot lane. That doesn't mean an awful lot of room for air. That, that is actually narrow, especially if you're in large vehicles. Large vehicles access up this all the time. 11 feet is, is pretty, a pretty standard width, um, but I, I understand it's in such. So Ralph, we'll, we'll look into that and just verify we're not missing something, because I, I definitely want to take that concern seriously. Um, Darren mentioned it in right now, Court South Parson Street is 11 feet, so we're following a similar. Yeah. Is the intent of these uh, narrower lanes to actually slow traffic a bit and post new speeds? It does slow you down naturally. They, they've proven that the, the narrower the lanes are as well as the other facilities like bikes and pedestrians and the more things you have in your corridor tend to slow people down. The more of a complete street, I guess <coughs> is the right word to use. It slows down traffic. So it's the lane width in front of the legislator building and the corner plaza that you know? We, we can look it up. <coughs> Yes. So are you planning on lowering the speed limit on this road? Is that why we're narrowing the roads and putting in bike lanes and all of that? Are you reducing the speed limit? The speed limit is shifting slightly. It, it's decreasing a little bit in certain areas. It's, it's hard to describe exactly where it goes 25 to 35. That is getting shifted <coughs> a little bit. So I believe this in this area right here, it's going down slightly. What slightly? The 35 limit is shifting. Further west. Further east, yeah. So the 35 mile zone is going to be extended further east. I walk? I don't know if you know the exact. It's, it's kind of mid block now in the near state street because where it changes and then we're just shifting it. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on where it is now, but we're shifting it to the salt. Just to. Yeah, here, yeah. In front of the. Oh, oh, then I can. Right here. Yeah, why don't you just take that? Mm -hmm. So.
So it, right now it, it changes somewhere in front of the park. It changes to 40. We're shifting that so that it's going it's to be actually at the intersection. So in front of the park, the whole way is 35. <coughs> So I take it that ADA accessibility and everything has been included in this project, correct? I'm sorry, I can't remember the question. A ADA accessibility as far as making sure it's compliance with ADA? Absolutely. Okay. That's one of the main goals of the project and the main purpose is to get ADA accessibility throughout the corridor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Was there any consideration given to, you know, you call it a move pull that used to have? Why not move the bike lane to that path, widen that path? And I've been to Europe times it's interesting they have a different colored portion of the multi-use path for bicycles and if you're walking them it's your at your own risk and you get a ticket you get an accident and so was there any consideration to blending the bike path in with that path to keep it away from traffic it seems like to me that would be an awful lot safer for people on bikes especially yeah we i think that came up a little bit and what we've heard is that you know commuter cyclists prefer to be on the roadway whereas when you blend it with a multi-use path you get more of the kind of the casual bicycle riders are the ones that are in the multi-use path and that kind of configuration I, we have seen that done at this particular intersection it would be better to have a roundabout so re regarding the roundabouts, so the the amount of travel lanes and the amount of traffic that we have on this roadway, a roundabout would have to be really large. It would have to be a multi-lane roundabout. So the amount of right-of-way that it would take to put in the roundabout, it was not feasible to do that. In addition, the roundabouts are not effective in timing the signals and getting traffic to continue to flow. So part of this project is going to be doing signal modifications to time the signals along the corridor to help traffic flow. When you put in a roundabout, it messes up basically the rest of the signal timing that you may have throughout the corridor. So in this <coughs> corridor, there's too many intersections in a row so that a roundabout doesn't make sense to put there. Um, under crosswalks, is, was there any consideration about the, the increase of uh, foot traffic on those crosswalks during events, especially you know busy Saturdays or work days and stuff like that? Because if those are going off continually, that could block traffic literally top of that crosswalk for 10, 20, 30 minutes. And that is one of the reasons we actually moved it away from State Street. So originally we had it proposed here at State Street where these bus stops are at. And there was concern with the crosswalk being too close to the Salomon intersection. And so that is why we are proposing shifting it further west towards the middle of the park so that if it is going off continuously, there's um, much more storage room between that and the intersection. Okay, that is a big expanse to cross the street right there with those lights. And if you're a pedestrian, it can be quite a scary experience, much less one that's handicapped. Have you thought about putting in a pedestrian medium in there so they have a rest stop there if they need it? Yes, so a uh, couple things. So this one will, will definitely have a rest stop in it. So the one at the park is going to have a refuge in the middle um, where they can stop. At the other crosswalks, at the signalized intersections, we've done what we can to also shorten the distance. So we're shortening the distance where we can for pedestrians to cross. You typically would not have a pedestrian refuge in an intersection. Um, for obvious reasons, if someone gets isolated in that island, you don't want the rest of the cycle, the lights to all go through and have somebody stranded there with yeah. cars coming in all sides of the road, right? So um, I, I think just a, a general comment for the group. I, I mean, I know there's a lot of great, very specific comments. Um, one of the challenges for staff that we have to do is we have to look at the project holistically, right? And sometimes we look at one individual uh, scope of work or one individual part of the project and go, man, this really makes a lot of sense. Why don't we have a roundabout here, right? Why don't we have another signal light going in there? Um, it's not as simple as just make, pulling the trigger and doing one thing here and one thing there because we have to look at the impacts that happen throughout the entire corridor. Um, and so, you know, 
we can't conflate a roundabout here at Salomon to the one at Stewart. I know some people love the roundabout. I know some people hate the roundabout. It's a really good big point of contention for a lot of people, right? But, but these situations are not all the same. And that's why it takes an in, a team of engineers and planners, consultants, the city, it takes these kinds of meetings, meetings with your elected officials to get everyone's input because every little thing that we tweak and change has a ripple effect throughout the corridor. Um, so if we, if we did one thing here, it would mean different things for crosswalks where we'd select locations for crossings um, throughout the corridor. Um, it, and again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, we're trying to accommodate as many people and as many ideas into the project that we can. That still needs sound engineering judgment. That still needs you know, modern planning practices for traffic coordination. Um, you know, I get it that you know, moving things around, shifting the speed limit, changing how we operate, may not be comfortable. Change is difficult. I totally get that. I'm not a fan of change myself all the time. Uh, myself all the time. Um, but please know that we have everyone's best interests in mind here, right? We're trying to, to pick the right pieces that fit within the corridor, that fit this project, that will help the corridor operate from now and 30 years from now, right? And that's another thing, too, that it's hard to grasp at this moment. When we look at our travel demand models, when we look at the engineering practices for the corridor, we look at right now, and then we look at 30 years from now. And we try to plan for how does the corridor operate now and how will it operate in 30 years? Do I have a magic eight ball that I can shake and tell me exactly what's gonna happen? No, but we can make good projections based on sound you know, judgment and sound assumptions that this is how we think things will progress, right? Based on what we've seen uh, historically. And so, you know, something right now, you might look at something and go, well, nobody uses that. Or, you know, that doesn't make sense to put that there. And you might be right, it may not make sense to put it there right now. But again, we're trying to accommodate traffic, so in 10 years, we're not coming in here and doing this again. And in 10 years, we come here and do it again, right? We try to find a solution that's a, a good fit, may not be a perfect fit, but a good fit for the next 30 years, right? So you don't have to come to these meetings anymore and listen to us talk about it. So <laughs> anyways, uh, with that, right? Yes, sir. Have you considered an elevated crosswalk? <laughs> Pedestrian bridge? Because like he said, if you have events at Mills Park, if you've ever tried to go past the high school for a half hour before, or hour before, half hour after, it's impossible because they just straggle continually. <laughs> like the, river, the crosswalk at the high school, the way it's, I don't know what they call that design, that has that helps a little bit with the break, but the ones at, is that Robinson? I mean, you could sit there for a half hour and the kids will just, and if you have an event at Mills Park, the fair alone could have kids going across that all day long. Right. Yeah, the pedestrian, sort of the pedestrian bridge concept was a concept that was raised early on that we did consider, but unfortunately the cost to do such is not feasible. So I, I think that's another really important point. Um, I know some, some people, maybe not in this room, but some people think that we have an endless supply of money, right? <laughs> oh, it's the city. They can fix it. They have an endless supply of money. Um, but I promise you all that we have a budget just like you all have at home. You know, when you pay your bills and you, you figure out how much water's going to cost you and how you pay for groceries and all that stuff, we have the same guidelines. Uh, right now, we're dealing with a very difficult time. Uh, procurement times have gone through the roof. Uh, some of our electrical components are taking 12 to 14 months just to get in the door, right? We can order today and we won't see them for a year. And I, can, I hope you can imagine how difficult it is to plan and execute a project when you don't know when things are going to come in the door. Um, that's just one of the items that we're struggling with. Um, pipe costs have gone up and down erratically. Um, trying to pin a price on how much it's going to cost us to do this have had wild swings back and forth, you know, from 100 bucks to 400 bucks, back down to 100 bucks again, right? Um, and some of those things are just very hard to predict. So we do, when we execute these projects, we do have to be very precise, but also very conservative, so that we, we let these projects out to bid. We're not telling contractors, hey, we have a $20 million project, but we only have $60 million to spend, right? And so everything that we do in here, uh, we, we've already started what we call the value engineering process, which is looking at what we're asking to do, and then we're asking our consultants very difficult questions. I say, Angie, I don't have, you know, what you're proposing in front of me, I don't have that in my pocketbook right now. I have this much to spend. I need you to develop me a project that has this. And then she comes back to me and says, okay, Randy, well then you don't get this. And so then we're tasked with a very difficult decision that says, okay, well what from the project are we willing to compromise and give up? Right? And again, that's the compromise that we're hearing from, from both sides, right? We hear 
half of the people really want every piece of the project to come to fruition, right? Everyone wants uh, splash pads and, and pedestrian bridge, and we would love to deliver all those things, but then we have to look at well, what's feasible, what does the budget actually allow us to do, and what are the core critical components that meets our master plan, the goals of the project, our complete streets policies, and any of the other master plans like the pathway master plans that we have in front of us. So it is a very difficult juggling act to try to accommodate that. Um, so getting back to your point on the pedestrian bridge, those are usually in the seven figure range um, because this is a truck route. We do have to have it to, to, to truck standard, so it would have to be like a 14, a 14 foot, seven inch uh, bridge deck standard. I get the cross size, it's probably open up the night. Yeah, and it's not out of the question. I think um, the board has heard that information. I, I know it's in front of them. Um, it, it could be a future project, absolutely. Uh, so that's something that could happen in the future. It's just not a part of this project. What's our budget? Okay. Yeah, we have one more. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I know you have the call medians and everything in there. Um, have you guys given any thought to adding cameras that take pictures of people who decide to run red lights all the time on 50? Because well, that's a big problem. <laughs> So, not with this project, that's more of an enforcement mechanism, so that would be something we would coordinate with the Sheriff's Office if we did find it was something that was occurring regularly and we got plenty of complaints, so please use Carson Connect if you're seeing that regularly and you can document that for us. Um, that's when things typically get elevated, if we have multiple people having the same occurrence over and over again, um, then we would elevate that to the appropriate enforcement mechanism. Okay, I will uh, continue on. So we were here talking about Salomon East Moran, and I think I, I covered most of the improvements here, except for on the right-hand side, side, you will also see that we're realigning the curb. So what we're doing is we're actually pushing the curb in. We're bringing it south. As you guys are aware, it's really wide in there. We're talking about narrowing the lanes. The, some of the lanes in here, I think the two-way left turn lane is 16 feet wide. There's 12 foot lanes, there's 13 foot lanes, and the wider it is, the faster people go, the harder it is to, to get across. And so on the north side of the road, we're gonna actually be shifting the curb line in, and in doing that, we still have room to add um, buffered bike lanes in both locations, maintain the traffic lanes that we need, and then it gives us the opportunity to improve the landscaping on the north side of the road. Next is Humboldt to Bulldust West. There is an existing, there are our improvements. Uh, in here, we will be improving the landscape areas on the north side of the road, uh, buffered bike lanes again throughout the corridor. Uh, we will be adding a dedicated right turn lane from William Street onto Bulldust West Way. And then as far as median goes, we're actually gonna be removing the median and that's in front of El Pollo Loco and we will be extending the median um, that is just east of Humboldt Lake. And last but not least, uh, this gets us to the end of the project from Bulldust West to I-580, which is where we will be connecting our bike lanes to the existing bike lanes that are there within the dot right away, as well as re reconstructing the pavement. And with that, I will turn it over to Dan. So, just uh, following up with what Randy mentioned early on, the, um, we're at 60% design and working towards 90% design. I hear you. Can we hear you? Is that next one better? All right, so yeah, we're, we're at 60%, between 60 and 90% is where we put a lot of effort into the details of the design. And so this is a great time to get comments from everybody and, and incorporate the ones that we can into the project. So just going over the um, project milestones from here, we're planning on having 90% design in the summertime and then 100% design late summer, early fall. Once we get to at uh, completion of design, we put the project out to bid, and that takes roughly a three-month period. Once that's complete, then it's built be early 2024, 
and the plans to construct the project through 2024. So we, we see the majority of the project being during the year of 2024 and then likely going extending into 2025 for a few months to address some of the loose ends, some of the final items of work. The, um, as Randy mentioned as well, there is some right away needs. So to complete these improvements, we have permanent easements as well as temporary easements to, to do work with the widened sidewalks, to drive by transitions. So we'll be reaching out to the property owners that we need those easements from in the next several months to discuss the needs and come to agreement on those. Then what, the, what is a permanent easement? Doing? Permanent easements, uh, an example of that is where we have like a, a sidewalk that extends into private property. And so we want to obtain permanent rights for the sidewalk. Another would be like fire hydrant city utility where we, we need to put that behind the sidewalk and it extends into the private property. And you have contact with the business owners, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, they, the property owners. Oh, yeah. yeah, so uh, the other thing is we've, we've been taking the project to the 30%, 60% or we've presented to the 30% plans to the Board of Supervisors and the Regional Transportation Commission. We plan to do the same for 60% and then 90% as well. So. Plan to do that for the 60% in March. So the RTC would be the March 8th meeting, and then the Board of Supervisors would be the March 16th meeting. And then the um, future community meetings, we plan to have one once we get the contractor on board to talk about the timing of construction. At that point, we'll have a better idea of, of when you'll be working in one part of the corridor and the impacts to the businesses through a year of, of construction. On here, we just we have a few ways to reach out to the project team. So www.carsonproud.com is the is the city's uh, site that posts some of our major projects. We're in streets on there, as, as as well as a few others. Right now, the site gets directed to the the Carson page, but if you put in this URL, that'll get you to the location. There's a texting service listed there, so if you text that number, you'll get updates through your phone. That'll typically be just a notification that says we post an, up, an update to the website and to go to the website to get more details. Then you're also welcome to reach out to myself, so my email is listed there as well as my phone. Oh, do you want me to go back? Is that complete? What was it? Is the NEPA complete? The NEPA is, the draft has been submitted, so it's in review. And I guess by submitted, we're to the federal agencies that are working with us on the project. Will that be able for public review? It will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, the NEPA is an environmental document. When Randy was mentioning the environmental impacts and the studies that were done, that's all part of the NEPA. I'm sure you don't have a full budget yet because you're really good early in the process. But how much is above ground and how much is underground as per your, per your comments? And roughly. And is it in the 20 million ballpark that was shown out? Just, well, is that just an example? I couldn't hear the second part of the question. Is it in the 20 million ballpark you were talking about or is that, was that just an example? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so I think the first part of that was how much of the project is well, above ground versus below ground. Yeah. And I don't know dollar amount. If it's Percent. Like half. Is that maybe ballpark a little bit less than half underground? Yeah. Less than half. Yeah, so maybe maybe forty percent underground, sixty percent above ground. And sorry, what was it? The total cost for the project. Total cost of the project is high teens at this point, so uh, in, the, in the high teens of million. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's correct. Given, given that, the relationship with the overhead pedestrian idea, is it going to be just one crosswalk or maybe two or three? I can't tell from what you said. One? Just one in those parks. Uh, and you're talking about seven figures, you're talking about a million more. 
Right. For a pedestrian bridge, yeah. For a right. proper pedestrian bridge in this right. area. Would be if very you're going to be stopping <coughs> people in that order so they can walk across with those bunch of lights all the time, on a busy day, and this gentleman is correct, you're going to have a lot more than a million dollars worth of problems for a 30-year project. Just a, just a comment. Yeah, my question was, uh, you know, this is a big project. Are you setting aside any money for future maintenance of this long street? Excellent question. Yeah, so um, the maintenance doesn't quite work that way. We don't set aside money for specific roads. Um, the roads as they're designed, they all mature or age at a different rate, right? And it's very dependent on how the road was constructed, the number of traffic, the vehicles that, that access that road, how heavy the vehicles are that access that road. So we don't predict road maintenance in that fashion. What we do is we have a fund that comes in. Um, you, if you've been to some of the boards, which I know both of you have been to a number, we have a funding shortage on our local road side of things. Uh, but on, on the arterials and collectors, we have a pool, basically. And every year, as we go down and look at the maintenance throughout the different districts in Carson City, we identify the ones that need the money the most. We split some of that money between what's called preservation, which is a using a topical treatment, uh, so it's like adding a band-aid to your skin, right, before the wound gets back. Right, so we treat the road with this preservation treatment, which is a lot cheaper than doing a full reconstruct, which is what you're seeing here, right? A lot of this road, especially on the west side, is a full reconstruct. Mic's off. I'm sorry, I think, I think the battery's dying. Let me try. <coughs> is that any better? Yes. Oh, thank you for saying something. Um, so, Anyway, so the maintenance, we, we look at preservation, and we try to spend uh, money on preservation to maintain the quality of the road, and the sooner we intervene on the preservation, the, the less slowly it ages or degrades, right? So if we can intervene soon, put the Band-Aid on, put the, the topical treatment on, it'll stay, it'll have a, a longer longevity and stay around with us without having rutting and cracking and, and being really bumpy and annoying for you when you drive down the road. Uh, when we get to a larger project like this, right, we've already gone down the path of the road has essentially failed in certain aspects, right? It, it's uncomfortable, it's very bumpy, it's got ruts, it moves you around when you're driving in a small light vehicle. And so at this point, it's exceeded that, and so we would use part of that budget, that pool of money, to fix the road, right? In this instance, we were successful in getting that $9.3 million grant, which we're very thankful for because the project wouldn't look quite what it looks like today without those federal dollars. Uh, but anyways, the, the maintenance is not a, you know, per project basis. We look at the pool of things, the general health, and we try to anticipate which roads could use the treatments the, the, the best, if that makes sense. Yeah, it seems like I heard quite a bit of concern from folks at this, just this meeting about the crossing issue. What about considering a controlled crossing rather than punch the button and have that thing be a free-for-all like a slot machine sure. to have a controlled time for people crossing? and shut that thing off for X number of seconds, let it drive it go through. They do make those, yeah. Yeah. and so the cost could be that much more. Sure. Yeah, it's something we can, we can look into. I don't know if we've considered it or not in our... I don't know if we Okay, so it's something we'll, we'll jot that down, and we'll, we'll talk back with our team and see if that makes sense for us. Let's cross it. How what? A strode. A strode. I'm not familiar with the term. A street road? Street? Or is it a road? Well, I would need to know what the definition of street or road is in here. Because you're trying to move traffic as efficiently as possible, which is great. But you're also trying to invite pedestrians and bicyclists, which is also great. But then cars and bikes are both going to be unhappy because now you cramp everything in this space. So was there a discussion as to whether it needs to be a four-lane road? Or two of them. Because if you're thinking about the, the long term growth, we're thinking about long term growth, you want um, the Highway 50 corridor to you know, be accessible to businesses in the future to grow and maybe turn those parking lot spaces into other, other buildings and develop you know, over time. And I, I think we need to make a decision as to who it's actually going to be for. Because we went to all this trouble to remove that from Carson Street. 
we, we went out of our way to get rid of that. Remove uh, what? Can you clarify? Remove the, the four lane yes. highway, which that was a strip. Now it's a real street. Now it's, it's there for everybody. Cars can still get through. Um, bicyclists and pedestrians can all enjoy this way. <coughs> but now we're perpetuating this road mentality <coughs> in William Street. Are we sure that that's what we want for William Street? That's a fantastic question that has about 15 elements that we'll take to address it. But I will do my best in like two minutes, okay? okay. And if you still have questions afterwards, I'll be happy to write <coughs> them. Okay, so this is what's called a complete street. A complete street is something that addresses multimodal use, right? So bikes, pedestrians, vehicles, buses. That is the concept, that is the master plan. That was the vision that the Board of Supervisors developed um, a long time ago, right? That's our complete streets policy. And so this particular road fits within our complete streets policy. Uh, you mentioned you have to determine what the use is, right? So we as the city don't determine what the use is. Development occurs through private property. They determine what the best use is for their land. Our goal is to adjust to what private development has to offer, right? So whatever businesses want to come to Carson City that gets through the development process, that planning commission or board of supervisors approve, that is what occurs on those properties if they have the intended use that it's zoned for. And the zoning is, is dictated by the master plan, the zoning master plan, right? So there's a number, like I said, there's a number of elements that you kind of touched on. What we're doing here is we're taking a corridor that already didn't really function the way it's intended and we're trying to improve it. So to your point, are we doing the best and ultimate thing that we would do if this was a brand new road? The answer is no, it is not. And that's just plain and simple, right? We're taking a, an art piece that's already been painted by somebody that maybe was left unfinished or we've changed the concept of what the art piece is and now we're trying to apply some finishing touches to make it into something beautiful that people want, right? That's not how development occurs typically. Typically, when you take a raw piece of land, you design the roadway, the corridor, to fit the need of the land, right? The, the needs here have changed over the last 100 years. And we're trying to make this work to the best extent practical. So is that, is that to say that it was never on the table to make a two-lane road? The, the traffic demand on this particular road is not the same as South Carson. So again, we cannot conflate different parts of town, different demands, different businesses, they're all different. We have to look at each project individually and the impacts that each project brings and try to address those in, in the best way that we can. Is every way that we address the road perfect? No, it is not. And we're not gonna get there. This corridor has how many points of ingress and egress? Like 40, right? And in today's standards, that would never happen. But there's no way to get around that because the businesses are already there. We can't go to that business and say, hey, sorry, too many points of access, you gotta go away. So we have to make the best use and the best situation out of, you know, I won't say a bad situation, but the situation that we're in. And so, and I've talked to a number of you about that, you know, this isn't perfect. We're not delivering, we're, we don't expect, we're not standing in front of you today saying we're delivering the best project that's ever been out there because it is very challenging. We have a lot of constraints that we have to live with. Uh, as far as going down to a two-lane road, no. The, the travel demand and what the expectation is, the use of the corridor from now and into the future, is it will grow. We still have, this is still a truck route, we still have a number of businesses. It is a major point of ingress into the city from the highway that gets you into central downtown. Uh, the way that South Carson operates and the way the traffic modeling works for that street, completely different. So they're, they're, they're different the way they operate, the different way we treat them and the way we design them. Even though it ends at a terminus, you got high traffic flow, but it stops. So that is part of the challenge is identifying. We talked about changing the speed limits, right? right. We talked about traffic calming. We talked about different points of uh, you know median curves and, and other traffic calming devices. The that is definitely a challenge that we're dealing with because you are correct. We're taking something that goes from a very high speed off ramp from the freeway and goes into central downtown Carson City, right? And so part of the goal of this project is to have safe and efficient access for everyone, not just setting it up for cars, not just setting it up for bikes, right? Try and get everyone to have equal fair share and access to the corridor. That is, again, the complete streets policy or you know, kind of the strobe, I guess, if that's what you nicknamed it, which I appreciate the, the gesture. Um, but again, so part of the reason and the need for those tra traffic calming features 
is to try to get people to understand that you're changing from a high speed portion of Carson City into more direct business access and downtown access. Yeah. So my question is, how come they weren't using Fairview? Because that road, the freeway goes into Fairway, and that's all set up down there where you've got a freeway that will go down to the other end and come in through the south portion of town instead of it interlocking right there at Carson and William Street. So, so to rephrase your question, why why not make this a narrower road and force people to go down to uh, Fairview instead of using this road? Yeah, for the ones, for the trucks and those that, that are using it, you know, and then to get around town that way. Sure. And to keep that more pedestrian friendly on Legend Street. Yeah. Being through a generation from here, I do remember the farms and, yes, and the train. And it used to not be that big of a road like that. So it's really changed over the years. So, yeah, that would be my... Yeah, so that's a that's a difficult question. So again, we're we're looking at um, how roads, are, what the demand of, of travel is going to be in the future, and we're trying to model. And unfortunately, a lot of the demand is predicated on what's already occurred, what developments is already there. And once that's happened, it's hard to move away from that, right? Once the development has been established, we don't expect the demand to just go away. Now, Carson Street is another really interesting example. The actual travel demand on that one went down. Right, and that is why we went to that two-lane road is because over time we saw the traffic drop off significantly since the bypass was created, and so it didn't make sense at that point for that design to have those features to be a wide, you know, big, big road there and to incorporate more pedestrian friendly. This is one of the only or one of the main primary arterials coming into downtown, other than Fairview, and so when we look at that as a whole and look at the city as a whole, it doesn't make sense to really restrict this one because a lot of people are going northbound too. They're coming in and doing the same thing um, just like north. And so at the end of, the, you know, the next step will be North Carson Street. And we'll be looking and having a very similar conversation on North Carson Street to make that more inviting, uh, likely doing some na lane narrowing in that corridor as well uh, for that specific purpose. But again, each project's a little different, how it functions. You know, just being east-west and one of the only direct corridors into downtown, that was one of the, the points of conflict that we had with narrowing even further than we already have. Scott? Yeah, on those narrowing um, mediums, from, well, from the way down, traffic calming. Can they be hazardous as far as people trying to find their location and turn in a certain direction? Have they considered painting? I haven't I seen painted ones before? Whether they don't have to, I mean, is it really calling or are people are looking to stress? And I mean, coming down that from, you know, from the freeway down. Yeah. I mean, have they painted them? Have they about painting them? Yeah, so um, I don't know. Painting in, in some of these situations would not be an ideal solution because people can violate painting all the time. And we can give tickets and we can have enforcement out there all day of the week. Is that the most efficient way of use of our law enforcement? Probably not, right? And so it is a balance between, you know, how do we keep enforcement going? How do we, you know, encourage people to do the right thing? Um, as far as safety goes, we expect that having these devices in here will actually increase safety, you know, throughout the entire corridor. Are they ideal? No. I mean, yes, we have to paint them sometimes. We have to repair them sometimes. We have other um, indicators, like we'll have the, the little uh, plastic reflective cones that go on top of the median to indicate their presence. They're a challenge for our snowplow operators, right? And so they have to be designed a certain way so that when the snowplows come through, they don't damage them or get damaged themselves. Um, so again, there's no perfect solution. I wish, you know, I wish this was an easy answer, like, oh, absolutely, this will work. But um, there, there obviously are not uh, mediums throughout the entire corridor for that reason, because they are expensive to build, they're expensive to maintain, and so there are select locations where it does make sense to restrict, you know, left turn movements across the freeway, especially in the higher speed zones, so we can reduce those points of interaction, so we have less accidents uh, in general. Now, if somebody hits their, you know, curves their, their tire or their rim on there, that's going to be a point of interest for them to pay attention next time they go through that and hopefully that will start with you know, people learning how to operate to the corridor, right? But again, if I can stop somebody from getting in a head-on collision and, you know, having an entire family of four killed uh, because, you know, some guy just had to get to the corridor, I feel much better about the first scenario. So, yes, there are challenges throughout the corridor. Some of them are not ideal, but, um, yeah. So those, those locations that they're set in now are set for sure, or can they be moved? Uh, east or west. They can still be moved if, as long as it makes sense, right? There's, right? And again, there's there's all kinds of constraints throughout the corridor. In your particular example on your business, 
Um, we needed a longer queue pocket to go southbound from the westbound lane from William Street onto North Carson Street. And so we're, we're obviously I, I talked to a number of you guys uh, a couple weeks ago, and we've actually we've changed since the time we talked to you. So it is still in flux. We are still tweaking and evaluating things. So no, it's not set in stone. Um, if we have good arguments, we've had some good arguments today about some things to, to challenge us and to go look at, and we will go investigate those further. That, that's that's my promise to you. Yeah, that's what we need to change it from there to the park and then to the freeway so Definitely. That'll be the lowest speed limit from that point, from the freeway to Main Street will be like 25 miles an hour, or will it be lower? Uh, I believe it's 25. Yeah, 25. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, we're always getting stuck with more taxes and more fees. I'm wondering, just you're getting 9.3 million federal dollars. Where's the rest of this money coming? And is it going to stop in the high teens? Or you know, who knows? Is it going to be the high twenties by the time this gets started? Yeah. No, it's a great question. As I mentioned earlier, we're on a budget, right? So we set the budget. We know what the budget is. Um, I believe the construction cost was 18.3 million. Four million. So that's the budget. Um, so to answer your question, some of the some of the other match portion from the local funds are coming from your local utility enterprise funds. Um, if you don't know what an enterprise fund is, an enterprise fund is a uh, funding mechanism that all of your bills, when you come in to pay your water bill or your sewer bill, that is an enterprise fund. So the city operates that fund kind of like a private business. So the only way those funds can be expended is by using that enterprise fund on that particular asset. So if it's a water bill, we spend that money on water. It doesn't get doesn't get spent for roads and things like that. So for the utility portion of it, the enterprise funds from water, sewer, and storm drain will be paying for a portion of the local match money there. We also have the, the VNT and the infrastructure tax. Um, those monies are going in there as well. What's that? That's very helpful. Very uh, well, yeah, it, it takes a little bit of everything, right? A little bit here, a little bit there, but that's what makes it work. Uh, we also had another $2 million in um, community development spending grant, a federal earmark that we got. That's going to help support some of the undergrounding. Um, and so we also have another $2 million that's coming from MV Energy that's helping to support uh, on a match program that they have. That's the UMP or Underground Management Plan. So uh, the city is actually getting a huge benefit. By coming to the table and having some of this local match money, we're getting a huge benefit from the federal government and other uh, systems that are, that are all pitching in to make this project work that we wouldn't otherwise get. If the city didn't come to the table and offer this money up, uh, we would not be able to have projects like this. That was not too many bucks. Description of where you're saying you're getting money from doesn't sound like $10 million. We, we have a slide. I'll dig it up and I'll find it for you and I'll show you exactly where the money's coming from. And anybody else that wants to stick around and see it, I'll, I'll see if I can dig that up and I'll show it to you. Okay, so there's a lot of projected growth for the city. So what are you guys doing to make sure that that happens? Yep. The people riding bicycles <laughs> on either side, that can become very dangerous because I know from driving around, people don't always stay in their little bicycle line and they're supposed to be staying in. Sure. Mm -hmm. yep. And you definitely don't want to hit somebody. So, so great question. So the ultimate buildout of Carson City, the last I checked, was around 80,000 people, right? So the, you know, we're at 61,000, I think, the last I read from the demographer. Um, so we've got about 19,000, 20,000 more to go. Um, those aren't all going to hit uh, William Street, right? We're not going to have 20,000 people driving on William Street, and they're not all going to come at the same time. So part of the challenge and what we do from an engineering standpoint is we look at the peak demand at different parts of the day. When we look at what businesses throughout the corridor, when is the demand going to happen, and when we look at, okay, what makes sense and what's coming through here. Um, the corridor has limitations, right? So let's say, for example, 20,000 people came tomorrow, they were all using East William Street. We would have to start looking at um, demolishing businesses, buying out property, and expanding the road. Is that something we want to do today? No. Um, right? But that's that's the next step of this evolution if that were to occur. But I want to, something I want to impress upon is that in the model, in the engineering, we've anticipated a growth factor. And I don't know what that number is off the top of my head. I don't know if anyone, if one or 3% or something. But anyways, there's a continual growth factor in the modeling that accounts for what we anticipate for growth to be. 
Is it perfect? No. Can we get more some years, less other years? Absolutely, right? So we're just trying to predict to the best of our ability based on standard practice, what works in other communities and what other engineers are seeing and studying. We apply those same rules to the quarter when we do the design, and uh, that's that's how we've come up with what we've come up with. So Is there if, a lot of people who ride their bikes on that quarter right now? Uh, right now, I don't, I don't see a ton, yeah. Well, I mean, but it's not very safe, right? And so it's, it's kind of a you build it, they will come scenario, right? I mean, if you can't say there's no bike riders and then not have bike infrastructure there to ride on, right? So. Um, I mean, there, there are definitely bike paths and some cyclists may prefer to use those other routes because they feel safer or, you know, it gets where they need to go. But again, we're trying to make a corridor a complete streets. That's the vision for the city. And we're, there are select corridors that make sense to have bike paths. We have a plan for where bike paths are expected to go. And so this is part of formulating that plan and getting everything designed and pulled together. Right? I mean, just like you like to appreciate the ability to go to the businesses and go where you want to go in your vehicle, people have prefer to ride bikes, people that have to ride the bus for whatever reason, whether they choose to or they don't, they, they need to get places as well, right? So it, we're trying to make it as inviting and as accommodating as we can for everyone that needs to be familiar. Um, Sorry, I just can't remember the time frame on this again. What was the time frame from kind of groundbreaking till the finalized, or is there an extension period, or I mean, this is open good. It's going to be the whole project the whole time, right? Not different stages. It's kind of, you know, the electric, electrical is going to go one way, there's new sewer, so they can kind of go, from what I understand, they're going to kind of the whole thing off, you know, go. I'll do my best to give you the 30,000 foot overview. So um, the design we anticipate to figure out, fi finish up in the fall, fall 23. Then it has to go out to bid. That process takes a couple of months to get that out to bid. Contractors have to review the documents and, and put a formal price out there. And whoever has the lowest price will be awarded the, the project. We anticipate the construction to start in early 24. Again, we've talked about a lot of studies that have to go on here. We've talked about right-of-way. We've talked about NEPA. Um, we also have the design that has to get finished. We also have another um, stormwater project that's tied to this. We also have an underground portion of this project. So there's a lot of pieces that if any one of them go wrong, it can extend it, right? So we're just trying to give you the best, you know, game plan here. And then as far as, um, you know, what does it look like as, you know, as far as demolition and construction? So Darren mentioned that um, once we get towards, you know, 90 to 100% design, we will be meeting, we'll, we'll have another meeting to have a construction impacts meeting. What we do at that meeting is we take a look at how the contractor is proposing to, to complete construction through the corridor. Typically, you start with underground, right? Because in underground, you're going to be saw cutting the road, digging a trench in the road, excavating dirt, finding the old pipe, replacing it, or you know, putting a new pipe in, whatever you're doing. But you're disturbing the road surface. The last thing we want to do is put in new asphalt and then dig it back up again to put in utilities, right? So the typical order of operations, we start with the undergrounding. We do all of the utilities. If we have overhead uh, power or um, telecoms that we're going to be undergrounding, we'll start there. We'll put in the necessary infrastructure, conduit, pull boxes, electrical boxes, meters, you know, everything on the quarter. That typically happens, you know, near the beginning to get the base foundation started. Then we'll typically start on the, the concrete. So we'll be doing some sidewalk improvements. I'll usually start with demolition. Uh, we'll typically have pedestrian detours. So when there are times where pedestrians have a hard time getting to businesses, we'll try to limit that. So we're not going to blow up the entire corridor and say nobody on the on the south side of the road, right? That would be a hardship for businesses. So we're mindful of that to the extent practical. So we'll work with the contractor to have select areas of demolition and reconstruction prior to that happening. So typically the way that works is we'll go uh, demolition of concrete. Then once that gets installed, it'll start curing. The concrete usually takes anywhere from 15 to 28 days to cure before we can start putting you know, weight on it and people walking on it. Once the concrete to the corridor is completed, then we will have uh, the road reconstructed. So we'll dig out all the road and we'll pave back to the concrete because the concrete ends up being like the bookends to the road. Um, that's generally how that happens. Um, as far as phasing and traffic control, we'll work with the contractor. And again, this will come through that meeting. A lot of that's contractor dependent, what they think is going to work the best. And again, there's a cost component to all these features. So if we want the best price, uh, part of that negotiation that we work with our contractors is if you're going to give us the best price, how do we deliver this to the city? 
knowing what our constraints are, right? So we'll tell the contractor what the constraints are. You know, you can't close down the entire road. You can't disturb businesses for so long. You know, so we'll have that all in the contract documents and they'll work with each individual business to ensure we can have continued access to that time. That's what I add The construction impacts the likely early 2024. That, that impact me will be early 2024 because we need to get the contractor on board and before we can have that meeting to talk about the details there. I'm just curious, the, um, being on such a tight budget, are you biting on where you, that you can chew on this budget? Because things that would concern me as a business owner would be keeping my business open. Um, been doing a lot of the base of construction at night, which elevates the price. But if you're on a you know if you're on a tight budget, you're not gonna do a lot of work at night because that's gonna increase the price and that's so that's costing us because you don't have the funding to do the budget as you would another. Yeah, no, it's it's a very astute point. Um, if we close the road down and did only night construction or if we close the road down completely for nine months, it would get done cheaper and it would get done sooner. So certainly incorporating <coughs> excuse me incorporating the businesses into this, there is a cost to that, right? There is a cost to the city. However, it's an important goal for us to make sure that the businesses do have safe uh, and adequate access to their business, right? Because we don't want a shop closing their doors because we came through and got up the road. So during that process, I mentioned the curing of the concrete. Concrete takes time to get to strength, right? Before you want traffic driving on it or heavy equipment driving on it. So during those times, we use what's called steel plates. Those steel plates bridge across the curb and gutter, the sidewalk. So those can continue to cure, but you still have adequate access to your business. So is it perfect? No. Are we going to require nighttime construction? Probably not. But we will make sure we have traffic being going uh, both ways on William Street. So we'll never have an entire road blocked off. You're not going to be able to have you know detours that go you know, a mile down the road and then come back. So we'll ensure we have pedestrian access, business access, vehicular access will all occur throughout the uh, you know, throughout the design or the construction of the project. Um, are there gonna be some rough times? Sure. That's that's kind of the primary goal of this impact meeting is to sit down with, with each individual business owner or property owner and say, you know, where are your pain points? You know, what are your business busiest hours? Maybe we won't start working here until after nine o'clock because you have a seven o'clock rush, you know, you sell bagels or something. Um, you know, we'll try to be mindful of that. So that will set the tone uh, about the things that we can accommodate in that contract and how we can, you know, work with you to keep access and keep things moving for you uh, throughout the construction. I have a couple of questions. Um, I see that you're, you're doing a lot of surveys, um, which is great. I was wondering if uh, we can do a survey on uh, people who use a bike. Is going to use William Street as a commuter thing because if there's not too many people, they can be accommodated in the multi use path that one other person uh, <coughs> mentioned and still not conflict with the complete street con uh, concept. Sure. So that I would recommend that. And the second thing is. I'm sure a lot of people are submitting comments. Is there a place in your website that we can see what those comments are? Yeah, so our goal is after this meeting, um, we're going to try to consolidate all the comments that we have here into a more like user-friendly or easy-to-review result, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or something. Um, but if you go on there, if you haven't yet, we have the results from the previous two surveys that we did, so you can kind of flip through there as well. So, yep, I uh, think you had your yeah, when and how are you going to notify us when the meet is ready for public comment review? Can I see that? Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think of, there's a, there's a public notice that goes out similar to the meeting, this meeting notification that would just go out to the, the main media sites. That's the typical process there. So you, you've got all our email addresses. Can you also add us to the, the mailing list for that? Yeah. So if we do have that as part of the um, stakeholder list, I imagine I've got yours. But anybody that does... Yeah, we're putting our email here. Yeah, so anybody that fills out the comment form will have it. Thank you. Yeah. And, and of course, if, if for some reason we miss you, if you sign up for the text, you can always get the notices. We'll try to update everything on our website. So when the NEPA gets posted, we'll absolutely have it on our website. And so you'll get that message saying, hey, go check out the website. Here's how it's posted too. So. 
just since we're on the topic, I had uh, after the meeting in May, I watched online. I signed up for the alerts for text, and I didn't get one for this. Okay. okay. Uh, I found out about it from the Nevada Appeal. Okay. Um, but yeah, just if something needs to be checked on that. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. We'll, we'll look into it. See, maybe something broken. Okay. Did we, did we cover everything? I don't see any more hands going up. Okay, so staff and our consultants, we're going to stick around for another half hour or so. Uh, if you guys have any questions, want to talk to us individually, please don't be shy. I don't bite very hard, so come and talk to us. Otherwise, thank you very much. I appreciate all your good questions, and uh, we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you.